The convention will please come to order. As a reminder, I would like to ask everyone to please silence your cell phones and portable devices. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. I'll ask our Reverend Charles Edwards to lead us in prayer as we prepare to undertake this morning's business. Almighty God, Father of power and might, we thank you for the gift of committed, courageous, and dedicated people who've served in the armed forces of the United States of America and who now serve as members of the disabled American veterans. Thank you for our national commander, Mr. Stephen Whitehead, and each person in every level of responsibility within our organization who have loved and defended our nation and who have helped to pass on to the citizens of our country and the people of this world the blessings of the past, freedom, the challenge of the present, liberation, and the hope of the future, peace. Provide all of us here today with a positive faith that we may see in every difficulty and opportunity, in every blessing and obligation, and in every task and objective. Be with us today in our deliberations. Keep us within your protective care. And may your blessings rest and abide on all of us. In God we trust. Amen. In order for a delegate to be heard at the convention, you must first be recognized by the chair. Only those delegates at a microphone will be recognized. They must state their name, chapter number, and the state they represent. Comrades, the convention rules are a continuing part of our bylaws. They are part or parcel of Article 3 and remain in effect continually. They are subject to amendment as provided in the bylaws and do not require readoption. Before we start here, I do want to make one quick announcement from this morning's memorial service. There was a cell phone left in the room this morning, uh, so if somebody was in the memorial service this morning, please come up and see Ron Mentor uh, for your phone. I would like to call on Credentials Committee for its report. Chairperson Brenda Reed. Good morning. Commander Whitehead, delegates. The National Convention Committee of Credentials met this morning in Tampa. This is a partial report for informational purposes only and reflects the registration as of 8 a.m. on 8-1-2021. There are 922 delegates and 59 alternates registered, representing 42 departments and 341 chapters. There are eight National Line officers 18 National Executive Committee members, and one past National Commander registered for a total of 27 National Officers. The total vote count is 7,741. This completes the partial report of the Credentials Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. At this time, I'd also like to introduce and recognize my National Chief of Staff, Greg Remus, Officer of the Day, David Boltonson, and Sergeant-at-Arms, James Burroughs. 
Thank you for your support as it has made my job easier. I'd also like to recognize a very special guest and a life member joining us today. Mr. Mickey Ganich, will you please stand? Ladies and, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, at a spry 102 years young, Mickey is a Pearl, Har Pearl Harbor survivor and a U U.S. Navy veteran. Let's give him another round of applause. I would also like to take the opportunity, do we have any other members of our greatest generations here? If we have another World War II veteran, will you please stand so you can also be recognized? Thank you for your service and historic contributions to our cause, Mickey. It is now my honor and pleasure to introduce the Executive Director of DAV's National Service and Legislative Headquarters in Washington, Randy Reese. Randy is a native of Bristol, Virginia. He enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1984 and served as a rifle squad leader in the 82nd Airborne Division during the Persian Gulf War. After the war, Randy served as an elite black hat instructor in the Air Mo Movement Operations and Jump Master Course at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. It was there he suffered a disabling back injury while conducting a night parachute jump. He separated from the Army in 1985, 1995. Randy went on to earn his paralegal degree from Kaplan College for Professor Studies professional studies and has become a nationally recognized expert on veterans benefits and services since he joined DAV as National Service Officer the year of his discharge. In December 2018, Randy was appointed Executive Director of DAV's National Service and Legislative Headquarters in Washington, D.C., where he serves as DAV's principal spokesperson before Congress, the White House, and the Department of Veterans Affairs. In this role, he continues to lead our advocacy efforts in Washington as others have before him, keeping us at the forefront of the fight for veterans' rights on Capitol Hill. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for your Executive Director of DEV's National Service and Legislative Headquarters, Randy Reese. National Commander Whitehead, National Agent Burgess, Distinguished guests, delegates to the 100th DAV and Auxiliary National Convention. I'm pleased and honored to be with you today in person to report on DAV service and legislative accomplishments since we last met. We come together at a challenging time of transition, a pandemic that has left more than 600,000 Americans dead and perhaps millions who will suffer long-term effects it's finally starting to lift. We mourn and remember those we've lost and all those who've been pro profoundly affected by this deadly virus. As disability rights advocate Helen Keller once observed, and I quote, the world is full of suffering. It is full also of overcoming it. That's what we must do, what we've always done in the military as disabled veterans, we have adapted and overcome. That's exactly what DAV did as COVID ripped across the country last year. At first, we didn't know what to expect, but that's not an uncommon feeling for those of us that served. It reminds me of my time as a black hat instructor at Fort Bragg. When new recruits to the 82nd would ask what they could expect from jump school. Well, I'd say, it's three weeks long. What else, they had asked. The first week, we separate the men from the boys, I'd tell them. Then, the 
Second week, we separate the men from the fools. <laughs> and the third week, they had asked, well, the third week, the fools jump. <laughs> Which is exactly what I did many times. Now I think it's time for me to jump back to my report. Winston Churchill once said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. I think that perfectly captures the spirit of DAV service program of veterans helping veterans. When the pandemic hit, our service team quickly stood up a new national phone system. Using voice over internet protocol technology, or VoIP, through a Vonage software package to ensure we could continue assisting veterans, even though we were forced to forego the face-to-face -face meetings. Our decision a few years back to lean into electronic claim submissions really paid off for our clients when social distancing required us to operate in a virtual work environment. At the Board of Veterans Appeals, our experience with virtual hearings allowed us to support veterans as the board expanded its use of new technologies to conduct hearings on computers, tablets, and even mobile phones. And despite all the COVID restrictions, DAV was still able to assist veterans file nearly, uh, nearly 140,000 new claims for benefits last year. And that's one of the reasons that 1.1 million veterans have chosen DAV to represent them. With over 4,000 DAV accredited or certified national, department, chapter, county, and transition service officers, you can all be proud that when it comes to helping veterans with their benefit claims, DAV remains second to none. We're also proud of DAV's Disaster Relief Program, which last year provided direct grants to 1,200 veterans affected by hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, and fires. As the pandemic forced businesses to close and many of our brothers and sisters were left without work, we quickly set up a COVID-19 unemployment relief fund. And I'm pleased to report that DAV was able to provide direct grants totaling over $2 million to more than 8,000 veterans. And when Congress closed its doors to the public, our legislative team also adapted and never stopped advocating to support veterans. As COVID spread, Congress switched from holding in-person virtual hearings, and DAV found new ways to maintain our presence and influence in Washington, D.C. Because of our reputation and expertise, we were able to continue promoting DAV's legislative agenda at virtual House and Senate hearings and roundtables. In fact, since the pandemic hit, DAV presented testimony at more than two dozen hearings and roundtables, both virtual and hybrid, effectively communicating our views on critical policies and new legislation to improve veterans' programs, benefits, and services particularly VA healthcare. We organized dozens of virtual meetings with VA officials, Capitol Hill policymakers, and our VSO stakeholders to build coalitions and advance our legislative agenda with much success. We worked with our benefit protection teams and members across the country to help them conduct virtual visits with their elected officials to promote DAVs vision for veterans, and our critical policy goals for the 117th Congress. And now, as Congress and VA begin to transition back to in-person meetings, hearings, and other activities, the relationships we've made and strengthened over the past year will maintain DAV as the leading voice for wounded, injured, and ill veterans. One of the newest and biggest issues before Congress today is how to support veterans exposed to burn pits and other toxic exposures. For years, DAV has called for legislation to concede veterans exposure to burn pits, provide them with health care, and make it easier to get their benefits. 
I'm pleased to report that both the Senate and House Veterans Affairs Committees have passed comprehensive toxic exposure legislation that contains many of the policies we've been fighting for. While the path forward remains complicated, with many obstacles yet to overcome, we've never been closer to enacting comprehensive burn pit and toxic exposure legislation. My friends, it's no longer a question of if, but when, and with your continued support, we will get it done. And this legislation will address not just burn pits, but also radiation, Agent Orange, and other dangerous chemicals that veterans of earlier generations have been exposed to. I'm pleased to report that at the end of last year, Congress passed legislation that added three new presumptions for Agent Orange exposure that will help thousands of Vietnam veterans. And we're working with the House and Senate to add a couple more. Agent Orange presumptions, including hypertension. Rest assured, we will continue pushing for comprehensive toxic exposure legislation that provides long overdue justice for veterans of all eras. As we provide veterans access to their benefits and health care, we must continue to ensure that VA health care system can meet their needs. To accomplish that, VA must have sufficient clinical providers, updated IT systems, and safe and modern health care facilities. That's why the VA Asset and Infrastructure Review Process, AIR for short, currently underway is so important to the future of veterans health care. For too long, VA hospitals and clinics have been neglected, leaving too many veterans no choice but to get their care outside of the VA. While we understand the need for community care, since VA cannot be everywhere at all times, we know that most veterans prefer the VA. So over the next two years, we need to be vigilant to ensure that the air process is done openly and honestly because the only conclusion that will be found is that it's time for Congress to fully fund VA's hospitals and clinics. We're also continuing our work to make certain that women and minority veterans have the same access to quality health care and benefits as all veterans. I'm pleased to report that Congress finally approved the Deborah Sampson Act last year. The Deborah Sampson Act includes a number of DAV recommendations to remove barriers and inequities for women veterans' health care and to eliminate harassment in VA facilities. We're continuing to work closely with VA and congressional leaders to ensure that the increasingly diverse veterans population is always welcomed and supported equitably. We must never leave behind any of our sisters or brothers who served in the military. <clears throat> We've also got an obligation to the families of veterans those who serve and sacrifice for their loved ones. That's why we fought so hard to pass legislation that expands VA caregiver assistance programs to cover severely disabled veterans of all eras. But although it was a year late, we're pleased when VA finally started admitting caregivers of veterans from World War II, the Korean, and Vietnam last October. Now we must complete this work to include caregivers of veterans injured between Vietnam era and 9-11, like our own past National Commander Dave Riley and his wife Yvonne. Over the past two years, we've also been able to get legislation approved to eliminate the Survivor Benefit Plan and Dependency Indemnity Compensation Offset and lower the DIC remarriage age to 55 for veteran survivors. But there's still more to be done 
including passing new legislation to increase those DIC rates and provide graduated benefits to support more surviving spouses. We must never forget families who have, of those who've made the ultimate sacrifice. <laughs> My friends, we've had a number of victories the past couple of years, and we should all be very proud of them. From our service and legislative headquarters in Washington, D.C., to our national headquarters in Kentucky, to our departments and chapters around the country. All our success comes by working together as a team. Yet we should recognize and reflect that this has also been a time of sorrow and loss for many, and they still have much to overcome. A couple weeks ago, I was walking through the American Veterans Disabled for Life Memorial in Washington which, if you haven't been there, I highly recommend you visiting. The memorial is one place where we're slowly starting to see a sense of normalcy returning. More and more veterans, visitors, and passers-by are stopping to reflect and pay tribute. In fact, DAV Chapter 10 in Northern Virginia, which has put so many hours into cleaning and properly honoring this site, has finally been able to return with its volunteers after being unable to do so for the past year due to COVID. This magnificent memorial is filled with images and words of men and women who suffered and have been forever changed by their service. It's both somber and inspiring. I'm particularly awed by the words etched in the glass panels from former Senator Bob Dole, a fellow DAV Life member that I'd like to share with you. He said, in the end, what gets people through a physical or emotional crisis is not new technology or medication. Those things can help, of course, but it's faith that gives you the strength to endure. Faith that won't allow you to give up. Faith that manifests itself in the ferocious determination to take the next step, the one that everyone else says is impossible. Bob Dole not only said those words, he's lived them. And that's what we need to do as well. We need to take the next step, and then one after that, to continue helping our fellow veterans. And if we do, who knows what's possible. Thank you. May God continue to bless the DAV and the work you all do. Commander, that completes my report. I ask that it be accepted by the convention. Thank you, Randy. May I have a motion to accept Mr. Reese's report? Rob Hilliard, Department of Wisconsin, Senior Vice, makes a motion to accept Mr. Reese's report as reported. I have a motion. May I have a second? Francis Whitty, past department commander of Massachusetts, I second the motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The motion is carried. It is now my pleasure to introduce our national headquarters executive director, Barry Jezinowski, for his report. Barry is a Persian Gulf War era veteran of the United States Marine Corps who was medically discharged in 1993. You Marines, I'm telling you. <laughs> My fellow Minnesotan native was appointed to his current position in August 2013 after serving as executive director of the National Service and Legislative Headquarters in a numerous other leadership positions at the executive level in both Washington, Cold Spring, and now Erlanger, Kentucky. Barry is a widely respected as a selfless and visionary leader who has earned the admiration of key leaders critical associates and DAV members throughout the organization whose decision directly impacts veterans' lives. As DAV continues to evolve and enhance the depth and scope of the service, services we offer our nation's veterans, Barry's leadership has dramatically enhanced the organization's reach and efficiencies. He serves as DAV's Chief Financial Officer and Chief Operations Officer 
and his responsibilities cover all national headquarters departments, including volunteer services, employment initiatives, communications, accounting, fundraising, membership, human resources, information technology, outreach and logistics of one of America's largest nonprofit organizations. Please join me in welcoming this jailblazing leader in the world of veterans services, National Headquarters Executive Director, Barry Jasinowski. Good morning. Commander Whitehead, Adjutant Burgess, distinguished guests and delegates, it's such a great pleasure to be with all of you here today to talk about the state of DAV from our perspective at National Headquarters. And that perspective has changed tremendously, both literally and figuratively, in the past two years since we were able to gather as a body. As many of you know, DAV has a new National Headquarters facility. It replaces our aging and inefficient building that had been dedicated in 1966 and was double the size and on over double the land we needed for our current, though growing, operations. As we prepared to move to the new location, we went through our archives and came across an artifact that meant a great deal to its creator. What you see here is a vase that was created by an American serviceman from an empty shell casing during World War II. The top is flared, and on it is etched a beach scene with palm trees and an old hut in the background. On the back, in simple letters, it says New Guinea, the site of some of the most arduous combat by Allied troops in all of World War II. One senses that the artist was looking for peace. In the midst of a long and difficult battle, he chose to envision a place that would otherwise be an island paradise. Trench art is likely a fascinating genre to many of us. The idea of combatants experiencing the deprivation of war and finding ways to escape through art is unique. It leaves us with an expression of beauty born from conflict. It shows the resilience of our warriors who fought both an enemy bent on their destruction and an ongoing battle to maintain their humanity. In our hearts, the AV members of all eras have proven themselves to be artists in their own right. To become eligible to join DAV requires one to have faced a life-changing setback. And once a life is taken off course, the veteran must learn to adapt and overcome. Doing so requires a level of creativity. That's one of the most important characteristics that we bring to the table in our fight to make families whole after a sacrifice is made for our nation. The sailor, soldier, or marine who made this vase put a tremendous amount of detail and time into the work. It was likely a form of relaxation and therapy for him. We can very well imagine that the war challenged him and changed him and while it may have taken away some of his capabilities, he grew in other directions and found ways to make his life work. He found a way to express beauty in a time of desolation and sought hope in a world of despair. That's what we've seen from so many of our members through these trying last couple of years. And that's the approach we've taken at National Headquarters to address the pandemic of our age. DAV's new headquarters is a testament to the creativity inherent in our cause and a salute to the service and sacrifices of all who have served. From the start, we knew we needed a very efficient and, and appropriate space. We considered our mission today and tried to forecast how it may evolve in the coming century. As was our approach in the military, we struck hard and fast. By pushing aggressively in the lead up to the pandemic, DAV saved over $600,000 on the cost of steel alone for the project. We made some difficult decisions as well. On visits to our national headquarters in the past, many of you may have seen paintings by Norman Rockwell, two of them, and N.C. Wyeth, one of them, in our visitor center. The paintings were donated to DAV decades ago. They were beautiful pieces that we had restored, that we had maintained, 
and even insured at a cost to our charity. Yes, they provided our guests with a noteworthy experience. But while we own the originals, we did not own the rights to reproduce them. Our headquarters in Cold Spring received comparatively low traffic and hanging on a wall, they weren't contributing to our purpose as a charity. So we used them to create a new work of art, one where design meets function. Between the proceeds from these paintings, the sale of our current headquarters, and assistance from a dedicated capital campaign, we anticipate that the total cost of the new facility will be fully covered. In the years to come, the savings we'll experience from conducting our national operations from a facility half the size of its predecessor will compound. With vastly improved energy and technical efficiencies, this project will result in a long-term savings to DAV. It is designed to provide significantly more space for collaboration between team members and stakeholders. It's located in a much higher traffic area where we will be able to engage more veterans and increase our local awareness. Traffic studies we reviewed reveal that over 150,000 cars per day pass by the location on I-7175. And from nearly every vantage, DAV team members, supporters, and guests will be reminded of our mission and the sacrifices made by those we represent. Also, speaking of remembering sacrifices, one unique feature we're very proud of is adjacent to our new facility. The DAV Honor Garden provides a unique pathway for each military branch where members and guests can walk in contemplation, remembering their brothers and sisters and those members and supporters named on bricks that line the path. By the way, uh, you can secure a brick through a special booth called Supporting More Victories for Veterans in the exhibit area outside the ballroom. Uh, I wouldn't be DAV's chief financial officer if I didn't make that pitch. <laughs> we feel like we've done a thoughtful job that will be appreciated by both our members and supporters. We tried foremost to create a space that made us more effective for the veterans and the families that we serve. We tried to think of everything. We even included the Space Force, though we don't have any members from our newest branch just yet. And while we needed to upgrade from an aging and efficient building, we know that DAV's new headquarters is not DAV. DAV is a community. It's all of you here. We are DAV. While the construction was underway, we never stopped growing in terms of how we serve veterans and how we empower you, our members, to accomplish your mission and communities nationwide. The new headquarters is just one of the major projects we've undertaken that is nearing the finish. And as some of you know, and, have some, and some of you have experienced as of late, DAV is implementing the largest internal IT infrastructure project in our history. We appreciate your patience. Our new customer relationship management project combines nearly every contact in nearly every database across DAV into a single application. It allows us to customize our outreach and engagement, eliminates duplication of efforts, and allows us to fully understand and recognize the contributions of those who assist DAV in multiple ways. It'll make us better at serving you and more effective overall. Though it will be an ongoing project, it is ultimately an elegant solution to a very complex requirement to manage data in ways that serve veterans. It's that same kind of thinking that allowed us to adapt in the face of the pandemic and other areas as well. Many here experienced the virtual salute we hosted in place of our national convention last year. We have an obligation to recognize the people who make our mission possible, but it wasn't the only engagement we held digitally. Our ability to pivot from physical to virtual career fairs was a bright spot in dismal times for many. Last year, we hosted 92 career fairs with more than 32,000 attendees. In addition to helping veterans and spouses find high quality work, we recognized the toll unemployment was taking on those we served. 
We are extremely proud of our collaboration with our team in Washington and our national service officers that provided the millions of dollars in relief to veterans who lost their jobs as a result of COVID-19. We've kept our foot on the gas, and as we are looking into uh, federal utilization of service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses, we partnered with Patriot Boot Camp to assist veteran entrepreneurs and their spouses. If we can help more veterans succeed as business leaders, they are highly likely to fill the ranks of their new companies with their fellow veterans. We continue to work with companies to promote hiring and assist their employees who have served. We held a financial town hall event for veterans with CNBC and worked to share information and resources for veterans who were ready and able to go to work. We're also revamping our employer recognition program so it goes beyond an annual award and encourages more companies to hire veterans. If someone wants to hire disabled veterans, we want to recognize them. You can nominate an employer, by the way, by visiting patriotemployers.org. That's patriotemployers.org. The process is quite simple. Volunteerism, of course, faced a sharp decline in the shadow of COVID-19, but we can be proud of our volunteers who undertook extraordinary measures to safely transport veterans to get the care that they earned. When nearly everything was shut down during a global pandemic, we can proudly say that we never quit. Our Fords were on the road providing nearly a quarter of a million rides. Our sincere thanks to all of our volunteer drivers across the country. At no time was our transportation network down completely. Though we couldn't hold the National Disabled Veterans Winter Sports Clinic or the National Disabled Veterans Golf Clinic with the VA, we were able to work together to provide substantive virtual instruction to the profoundly disabled veterans who were stuck at home. DAV finds a way. Our public service announcements enjoyed 9.7 billion impressions in 2020, and we're looking forward to launching a new series of Victories for Veterans messages by this time next year. Between airings and promotions, the battle never ends. Our centennial documentary enjoyed more than 11 million impressions and continues to be available online. Our partnership with Disney continues to grow and the centennial received notice on ESPN radio where a feature on our founder, Judge Marks, aired from September 15th through the Veterans Day timeframe. We're receiving more public notice than at any time in our history. And while we look forward to completing our important infrastructure projects, we're not taking any breaks, ever. We're constantly striving and looking to innovate. While there remains an information technology gap with some of our members, it's shrinking. It was only in the past two years that we began seeing more mobile than desktop traffic to the website, and online membership applications have exceeded paper submissions. But to be the charity veterans deserve, we're developing and employing very creative digital recruiting techniques to target prospective members. We're rolling out initiatives like Recruit a Warrior that empower our members to bring more veterans into our cause. The website will be enhanced again by early next year and will continue to refine and improve it in the years ahead. We're digging into new ways people can support our cause and optimizing our existing approach. If someone wants to donate their car, real estate, electronics, or clothing to support veterans, we want to make it as easy as possible for them to do it. If someone wants to host their own digital fundraiser to support our cause while becoming more fit, we want to make sure they have the tools to do so. And even if they want to sit on the couch and support veterans, we're looking into electronic gaming <laughs> as a potential source of revenue and awareness. They can help too. In our difficult and challenging fundraising environment, DAV received almost $11 million more in 2020 than we did in 2019. We've diversified our streams of revenue, and the investments we've made in outreach and innovative fundraising efforts have blossomed and are bearing fruit. Our virtual DAV 5K had more participants than in any previous year during the pandemic. It raised over $330,000 to support our mission. From both a net revenue and outreach perspective, it was our best event ever. Speaking of the DAV 5K, 
We had a special members challenge last year. Our top fundraising member was Kurt Olstrom Freschetti from the great state of Ohio. Our top Our top participating state was the DAV Department of New Jersey, led by Adjutant Johnny Walker. <laughs> this year's 5K will be held in person in Cincinnati on November 6th, and will be available for virtual participation as well from November 6th through Veterans Day. Thank you so much to all of you who have participated in all of our past events. Your DAV is continually optimizing our operating procedures to make sure we're as lean and efficient as we can be while continuing to deliver the most substantive services to empower the veterans and families we serve. A very famous DAV Life member once said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. As veterans who have benefited from DAV services, it is our duty to become experts at connecting veterans with our services and to give back to support our patriotic cause. If you're helping a veteran connect with the benefits they've earned, that veteran may also need a job. If you're driving a veteran to a medical appointment, he or she could probably use our assistance with benefits and employment. If we help a veteran in any number of ways, we should ask them to join, and we should be prepared to tell them about our services and the great work we are doing to protect and secure new benefits in Washington. If you can give, we ask that you consider supporting DAV. Think of the benefits that DAV helped you attain and consider giving back by joining the Warriors Club to continue giving. Honor your fellow veterans and consider how you could build a legacy of support for them by including DAV in your estate plans. If interested, visit freewill.com DAV to simply complete a will that will include DAV in a matter of minutes. There are many ways to give. From our vantage today, we can look back on 101 years of tireless effort to ensure a promise is kept to our nation's heroes. We see the crushed shanties and battered spirits of our impoverished forebearers who marched in the Bonus Army. We see our nation attacked, the turbulence of the 60s, and the toll that wars and scars have wrought on generations. We see the end of war in Afghanistan, though the cost of that war, as has been the case with all wars, will be paid by those who bore it for decades to come. As we look ahead, we're in a unique position to learn from our history and change its course. We can achieve justice for our brothers and sisters who have and will see the wars of yesterday and tomorrow. We can honor their service and truly make them whole in spite of the obstacles in our path. Doing so will require our dedication and creativity, but together, DAV is up for the challenge. Commander, this concludes my report. Thank you, Barry, for that outstanding report. May I have a motion to accept Mr. Jezinowski's report? Lee Gittin, Department of Ohio, Chapter 35. I make a motion to accept the report. I have a motion. May I have a second? Mike one, Scott Hope, Department of Pennsylvania, Chapter 76, seconds the motion. All those in favor, signify by, by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion is carried. At this time, DV would like to recognize the extraordinary generosity of the law firm Chisholm, Chisholm, and Kilpatrick in Providence, Rhode Island. This past year, the firm donated $100,000 to support DAV's free programs and services in honor of our centennial celebration. We are joined today by CCK's founding partners, Scott Kilpatrick, Robert Chisholm, and law partner, Zachary Stoltz. In 2008, Chisholm, Chisholm, and Kilpatrick initially collaborated with DAV in representing veterans with their appeals before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, and the Board of Veterans Appeals. Since then, the firm has represented over 13,500 veterans in court with an overall success rate of 90%. Chisholm, Chisholm, and Kilpatrick also works closely with our legal department 
in the stewardship of DAV's charitable bequests. Apart from its work with our service and legal departments, the firm has donated well over half a million dollars to DAV. The money donated has supported projects such as the care and maintenance of the American Veterans Disabled for Life Memorial and DAV services and programs. We truly appreciate Chisholm, Chisholm, and Kilpatrick's continued support and its most recent gift of $100,000 in honor of DV Centennial Celebration. Thank you, gentlemen, for the tremendous impact you've had on DV. We thank Chisholm, Chisholm, and Kilpatrick for your loyalty, commitment, and the talent that you have devoted to disabled veterans and our organization. I now invite Scott Kilpatrick to say a few words on behalf of the firm. Thirteen years ago, CCK and DAV began a partnership to provide pro bono representation for veterans and their families who wish to pursue their VA benefits to federal court. That year started with a few select cases. Today, through its partnership with DAV, our firm now files well over a thousand appeals a year to the United States Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. This partnership has also led to dozens of precedential decisions that help ensure our government keeps its promise to our heroes. We are honored to be trusted with this important work and in the spirit of our partnership with DAV and friendship, we present this check for $100,000 to support DAV's mission. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, and thank you all of your support and commitment over the years in the veterans community. It is now my pleasure to recognize the Outstanding Local Veterans Employment Representative and Disabled Veterans Outreach Program Specialist recipients of 2021. These awards recognize the commitments and compassion of two individuals who are dedicated to serving our nation's heroes. The recipients who are to here today are outstanding examples of veterans helping veterans and we're more than proud to honor them for the dedication and selfless service. The award for Outstanding Local Veterans Employment Representative is presented to an Army veteran in Texas, native Larry, uh, Lee Ware. Unfortunately, Lee was not able to make the trip to Tampa to be here in person to receive his award. He began his career in February of 2018 and immediately made an impact on the Employment Department by facilitating the hires of 15 veterans within his first four months as a member of the North Texas District team. While the COVID-19 pandemic was in full swing, Mr. Ware helped coordinate the first two virtual career fairs in Tyrant County. These efforts place over 300 veterans in front of 78 employers looking to hire. Congratulations, Lee. The 2021 Outstanding Disabled Veterans Outreach Program Specialist is a passionate and tireless advocate for Texas veterans. This year's recipient is Tremaine Hubbard, who was also unable to join us. An Air Force veteran and DAV member, Tremaine has executed outreach to more than 150 veteran and community organizations while establishing strong partnerships dedicated to assisting veterans in overcoming significant barriers to empl employment. In early 2020, because of his commitment and professionalism, he was handpicked to fill West Texas District DVOP coach position. Thank you, Tremaine, for your amazing work.
Now, I'd like to invite our National Employment Director, Jeff Hall, to the stage. Each year, DEV recognizes companies that go out of the way to recruit and hire disabled veterans. It is my pleasure to announce the DEV Employer of the Year Awards for three outstanding organizations. The 2021 DEV Small Employer of the Year Award goes to an incredible company that truly recognizes what veterans bring to the workforce. This year's Small Employer of the Year goes to a fitting company for the times we live in. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Virtual Service Operations CEO Steve O'Keefe to the stage. First of all, I would like to thank Commander Stephen Whitehead and Vice Commander Andrew Marshall and the entire DAV team for what they do for the veteran community and, of course, recognizing VSO for our work with veterans. VSO is successful because it hires veterans. VSO is successful because it hires veterans. The investments these men and women have made in the service of our country makes them invaluable team members. By far, the DOD is the most significant training organization in the world. This is the truth lying in plain sight. Like a gold mine that is just awaiting the relatively small investment in the tools to mine it, it is there for every company to benefit. Any company who wants to be successful should hire veterans. Any company who wants a more diverse workforce in every aspect should hire veterans. Any company who wants a virtuous workforce should hire veterans. Thank you again, Mr. O'Keefe. Our 2021 DAV Mid-Size Employer of the Year, Geo Stabilization International, was not able to attend, but effectively recruits veterans across the nation, partnering with numerous organizations and conducting outreach to find talented veteran candidates. Currently, 11% of the company's 443 employees are veterans, and nearly 25% of their 138 new hires in 2020 were veterans. Outstanding job, Geo Stabilizations, and keep up the work, great work. The 2021 DAV Large Employer of the Year is one of the largest electric power holding companies in the U.S., providing electricity to 7.8 million customers in six states. Duke Energy has a dedicated military and veteran recruiting team to support the attraction and hiring of veterans. Their team is committed to building and maintaining long-term relationships with transitioning service members and veteran job, veteran job seekers, hiring managers, and external veteran organizations. I'll ask Ms. Alyssa, Melissa Seishi, State President of Florida with Duke Energy Corporation, to the stage to accept DAV's Outstanding Large Employer of the Year Award.
Thank you all so much for having me here today. This is absolutely an honor to accept this award on behalf of Duke Energy Florida and to spend the morning here with all of you. Thank you for your service to our country. Um, and while I'm very proud to be standing in front of you as the president of Duke Energy Florida, I'm equally as proud to stand here in front of you as the daughter of a U.S. Army colonel. So at Duke Energy Florida, we value the leadership, the reliability, the high school techs that veterans bring to our organization, as well as their loyalty and their integrity. We are proud of our long history of providing career opportunities to our military, including transitioning service members, veterans, National Guard reservists, and military spouses as well. We actively participate in Enable America, a nonprofit established here in Tampa in 2002, funded in part by the Duke Energy Foundation that provides training and job placement assistance for transitioning wounded warriors and also disabled veterans. We support transitioning special operations forces by participating in the United States Special Operations Command Warrior Care Internship Program, which is also headquartered here at McDill Air Force Base. And one of the goals of the program helps Special Operations Service members develop and implement a customized career transition plan. This includes assistance with fellowship opportunities at Duke Energy. We employ more than 2,000 military veterans as project managers, engineers, cybersecurity analysts who defend our system, and line workers, craft and technical, who help keep our customers energized every single day. And annually, we hire almost 300 veterans. We also have an internal veteran uh, network group with over 850 members that hire, uh, that mentor new hires, help veterans adjust to Duke Energy's culture, and eases the transition to civilian life uh, through a program we call Together We Stand for Our Veterans. And we have two representatives here from Duke Energy today. Uh, one, Benny uh, Anderson, who is also the person who submitted our nomination. So we're very grateful to him. And also Loretta, who is our Florida representative as well. We've awarded more than half a million dollars to nonprofit organizations providing assistance to veterans and their families in seven states served by our company. And uh, each organization received a grant from the Duke Energy Foundation to strengthen programs providing essential services to military veterans and their families. And it is of just great honor every day whenever we are in a meeting and uh, I'm always surrounded by veterans and makes me extremely proud as a leader of our company here in Florida. So thank you again, this has been a privilege. Thank you, Melissa and Duke Energy for all the great work you're doing to helping veterans live a higher quality life. In 2007, DAV created the Local Veterans Assistance Program, or LVAP, giving volunteers nearly unlimited opportunities to serve and receive the same recognition and incentives as those available to tra traditional VA and transportation network volunteers. Under LVAP, opportunities abound for, for individuals to assist veterans and their families. From something as precise as building a wheelchair ramp or setting up a computer software to basic tasks like grocery shopping or running other errands, Volunteers perform any task that may help improve a veteran's life. I'll ask John Kleinitz and National Headquarters Executive Director Barry Jasinowski to the stage for their assistance, please. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my extreme pleasure to recognize our top DAV state level department, departments in the areas of LVAP services. The division one.
Thank you all the volunteers in the VA hospitals, our transportation network drivers, and participants in the local veterans assistance program for their compensation, compassionate services to disabled veterans and their families. Thank you for your helping hands and kind hearts. Please join me again in giving them all a big hand for their service. Every day throughout the country, DAV partners with thousands of passionate VA employees to ensure veterans are getting the resources they need and the assistance they have earned. We strive to work together as one in order to keep the promise to those who served. It is my pleasure now to present the National Commander's Outstanding VA Employee of the Year Award to three remarkable VA staff members. In recognition of their leadership, compassion, and dedication supporting our nation's ill and injured veterans. The 2020 Outstanding Veterans Health Administration Employee of the Year is Dr. Ronald Triolo. Dr. Triolo is an Executive Director of the Advanced Platforms Technology Center located inside the Lewis Stokes Cleveland VA Medical Center. Dr. Triolo has served as VA and veterans for much of his career. He was a long-standing member of the editorial board of the VA's Journal of Rehabilitation Research and Development and continues to be on the cutting edge of technology improving the lives of veterans. In recognition of his service research efforts, he was appointed to the prestigious College of Fellows of the American Institution for Medical and Biological Engineering in 2014. Due to family, member, family matters, the good doctor was unable to join us in person, but let's take a look at what he had to say. I'd like to thank the Disabled American Veterans for this tremendous honor of being named the Department of Veterans Affairs Health Administration Employee of the Year. I'm truly humbled by it, but I want you to know that I'm accepting it, not on my behalf, but on behalf of the more than two dozen dedicated clinicians and scientists who are pursuing original work at the Advanced Platform Technology Center in the rehabilitation R&D service of the VA. My personal line of research, which is a small fraction of what we do at the APT Center, focuses on mobility after paralysis from spinal cord injury, stroke, or multiple sclerosis. We excite the nerves that remain intact in the paralyzed limb and those nerves cause their associated muscles to contract. And by combining the actions of a number of different muscles, we can get a useful movement out of the otherwise paralyzed limb. To stand out of the wheelchairs, uh, facilitate a few steps in environments that aren't adapted, to remain stable and balanced in their wheelchair so they can use both hands to interact, manipulate, objects in the environment. We also use similar techniques to provide new options to exercise after paralysis. As you can imagine, the large muscles of your hips and lower extremities, they're unable to be exercised by other means and therefore we can promote overall health and general well-being, improve the function of the cardiovascular system and muscle bulk by getting them to contract, and improving their strength and endurance. And just imagine what it's like to be paralyzed and to ride a bike outside in the community and be seen by people as just another person out on a spin. We're also exploiting this technique of activating the nervous system to provide sensation to veterans with limb loss. And the notion is if we can excite the sensory nerves that are still in the residual limb, we can kind of fool the brain into thinking that uh, the user of this technology feels their phantom foot in contact with the ground. So we think this approach has a lot of potential to help make, making veterans more with limb loss more stable, uh, to help them walk in crowded environments, to help them prevent falls, and to just make them 
all around more functional in society. So with that, I'd like again to thank the DAV to say it's been a pleasure working with our VSO reps from the DAV in Cleveland and I hope that this marks the beginning of a long continuation of that productive collaboration as we pursue our goals together. Before I leave, I'd like to introduce you to someone very important to me. This, many of you may recognize as a G.I. Joe, circa the late 1960s. I had a conversation with my sons uh, last Christmas over what their favorite Christmas present was. They told me theirs and asked me what mine was. Well, it was Joe. Uh, they, of course, took him from me and started playing with him themselves. And in the course of that, they were a little rough and Joe lost his foot. Joe's now a transtibular amputee. And my one son said, well, he's not a GI Joe anymore. Now he's a VA Joe. So I keep VA Joe on my shelf to make sure that my effort and my vision and our mission are aligned with those of the DAV and to continuously remind me that we're here to help the men and women who served our country. Thank you, Dr. Triolo, for all the great work you're doing for veterans. Now I'll ask Executive Director Reese and DAV National Service Director Jim Marslack to the stage for our next important presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Outstanding Veterans Benefit Administration Employee of the Year, Navy veteran, Cian Faith. Cyan Faith, sorry. <laughs> I am overwhelmed with gratitude to be receiving DAV's VBA Employee of the Year. My passion for serving veterans continues to grow stronger every day. While working at VA and so closely with all of you and DAV, I learned how powerful we can be together and what a positive contribution we can make in our veterans' lives. As a veteran myself, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve our nation's heroes and to partner with an organization that puts veterans at the heart of everything they do. Thank you so much for this prodigious award, and I look forward to all the tremendous things that we'll do together. Thank you. Honoring our fallen and supporting their survivors in their time of grief is a sacred and patriotic duty. Please welcome to the SAGE 2021 VA National Cemetery Administration Employee of the Year, Greg Smith. First of all, I want to thank you, the DAV, for putting on such an amazing um, program, and thank each and every one for what y'all do. This award means a lot to me. Basically, I was given an award for doing my job. I come to work every single day to take care of our veterans and their families, and it's an honor to do that. I want to thank Leroy Kenner. Um, when I was in Wyoming with him, he welcomed me, made me feel like a team player. Floyd, thank you too, and thank each and every one of y'all. It's a great honor, and I appreciate it, and let's keep serving our veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith, for all the great work you're doing. 
DAV has over 4,700 members dedicated to recruiting veterans into the organization in order to maintain a strong voice with lawmakers and a robust offering of services for the nation's veterans. Much has changed throughout our 100-year history, including the needs of veterans we serve and, just as importantly, the way we reach them. Our dedicated recruiters have evolved to meet these challenges head on and have worked diligently to welcome new members to ensure DAV's legacy lives on for future generations of veterans. For our first award, I'll invite Executive Director Barry Jezinowski and National Membership Director Doug Wells to the stage as we recognize our top division winners in recruiting for 2020-2021. Please stay right there, Dick. All right, you, South Dakota, you've definitely stepped your game up this year. Our next award is the General Jonathan M. Wainwright Award. It is presented to the department that closes the year with the largest percentage increase in total new members. The winner is Davy South Dakota. <laughs> And again, don't go anywhere, Dick. <laughs> the Judge Robert S. Marks Award is presented to the department that completes the year with the highest percentage increase of fully paid life members over the goal. This year's winner is, again, Department of South Dakota.
I got to do it in sound script here, but way to go, District 14. <laughs> no one is more likely to join DAV than the veterans who have experienced our assistance. Those who experience DAV's free services firsthand understand the life-changing value of our organization, but it still takes a special type of national service officer to communicate the value and advantages of joining our, our organization. Our next award recognizes individuals who go above and beyond the call to ensure the long-term health of our membership. Therefore, it is with great pride that I present the top recruiter for our NSO Corps, who remarkably recruited 308 veterans to join our ranks. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Carlo Malone of Chicago, Illinois Service Office. Our top recruiting member of the year is Keith Pelosi from DAV Chapter 57 in Dallas, Texas. He recruited 118 new members. Unfortunately, Mr. Pelosi was unable to attend this year's convention. Since 1994, DAV has recognized the success of its members who have assigned 100 or more new members for three consecutive membership years with a gold lapel pin and by entering their names into the Membership Recruiters Hall of Fame. A few of these folks may be here and will join us on the stage. This year's inductees are Keith Pelosi, who recruited a total of 118 new members, Thomas Harrington, who recruited a total of 103 new members, Andrew Edwards, who added 104 new members to DAV, <laughs> Daniel Ob1, <laughs> Daniel Ob1 Kenobi who added 102 new members to DAV. Friends, think back to the time when you first introduced, when you were introduced to DAV. How did it change your life? How can you help do the same for another veteran? Take that leap and ask the question, are you interested in becoming DAV, a DAV member? As always, thank you for another great recruiting year and keep up with the wonderful work you're doing. I now would like to call on Board of Directors Treasurer Robert Cox for his report. He's still putting his notes together. <laughs> Commander Whitehead, fellow members of the National Executive Committee, DAV members, and guests, good morning. Let me begin by recognizing those whom I serve on the Board of Directors. Chairman Dennis R. Nixon, Texas. Vice Chairman Andrew Marshall, Florida. Secretary and National Adjutant Mark Burgess. Director and NEC 12th District Kevin J. Walkowski, Wisconsin. Director and NEC 13th District Terry W. Sanders, Indiana, and Director in NEC 21st District, John Donovan of Arkansas. 
It is my honor and privilege to present a report on the financial affairs of our organization for the six-month period ending June 30, 2021. DAV's total fund fundraising support through that date was a little under $63 million. <laughs> Contributions were in excess of $50 million. Bequests were just over $12 million. Under the department fundraising program, payouts to departments in December 2020 and April 2021 totaled just about $3 million. Since the program began in 1994, uh, almost $110 million have been distributed to departments for their service programs. The board would like to thank all of our departments for their continued participation in these programs, and especially our members for their generosity. As of June 2021, DAV received total support and revenue from all sources of roughly $154 million. Also through June 2021, DAV had total expenditures of close to $112 million, of which more than $90 million were for service programs, which is 81% of total expenses. Over the same period, fundraising expenditures of $16 million were comparable to 2020. Administrative outlays were a little above $5 million. As of June 30, 2021, the market value of our general fund long-term investment portfolio is roughly $482 million. DAV's net assets or net worth increased from slightly more than $345 million at this time last year to in excess of $462 million, a $117 million increase, or 34%. As COVID restrictions are lifted, DAV will increase spending on services to veterans in accordance with our mission. We are also devoting funds to new fundraising opportunities. We will continue to use our resources wisely. We are also pleased to report that at June 30, 2020, the Life Membership Fund Reserve was approximately $53 million. Commander, it is my privilege to present DAV's proposed 2022 annual budget for ratification by the convention. At the May 26, 2021, meeting of the Board of Directors, the Board was presented the 2022 proposed budget. The Board unanimously approved the proposed budget at that time, a copy of which was provided to all convention members at registration. I would like to thank National Adjutant Mark Burgess and his staff for all their hard work, which makes this report possible. Let me thank you, Commander Whitehead, for the support I received in my role as the Board of Directors Treasurer. It has been a privilege to hold this position. Commander, this concludes my report to the National Convention, a report I feel honored to offer to our delegates. I thank you and move for adoption of my report and approval of the proposed 2022 annual budget. Thank you, Robert, for your service and that very inform informative report. I have a motion. May I have a second? Mike two. Mike two. Mike two so, submits for acceptance of the report with gratitude to the members. All those in favor. Say John, I'm sorry, John Parker, okay. PDC, Chapter 35, Ohio. Thanks, John. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered. I would like to call on Chair uh, Chairman Rob Reynolds 
for the report of the Com Committee on Constitution Bylaws. This is the first reading of the proposed bylaw changes. Comrade Commander and Delegates, good morning. The National Con Convention Committee on Constitution and Bylaws was called to order on July 31st, 2021 by the committee advisors Rob Reynolds and Ed Hartman. The first order of business was the election of a convention committee chairman and secretary. Rob Reynolds was elected as chairman and John Polk was elected as secretary. The committee then proceeded to review the resolution submitted and I will now report to you the resolutions recommended for adoption by this national convention. For the purpose of saving time, I will read only the number and purpose of the resolution. Resolution number 510, include DAV statement of policy as Article 2, Section 2.1 of the National Bylaws and renumber the current section 2.1 as 2.2. Resolution number 511, Amend Article 3, Section 3.10, Convention Rule 8A, to remove the National Blind Chapter from having a delegate and alternate on each of the seven convention committees. Resolution number 512, amend Article 6, Section 6.4, Paragraph 4 of the Bylaws to place members of a revoked chapter into the chapter nearest to their home rather than placing their membership into the department at large chapter. Resolution number 513, amend Article 7, Section 7.4, Paragraph 3 of the bylaws to remove the geographical locations of the national headquarters and the national service and legislative headquarters. Resolution number 514, delete Article 7, Section 7.8, in its entirety and renumbers section 7.9, 7.10, and 7.11 accordingly. Section 7.8 is redundant as the national adjutant already has the authority to oversee and direct all activities of the national organization as outlined in 7.4 paragraph 1. Resolution number 515, amend article 11, section 11.3 paragraph 3, of the bylaws to allow the national organization to pass on the continued eligibility of membership of any member. Resolution number 516, amend Article 11, Section 11.5 to remove the reference to amputee veterans as a national amputee chapter surrendered their charter due to non-participation and no longer exist. Resolution number 517, amend the language related to membership transfers in Article 11, Section 11.8, Paragraph 1 of the bylaws to coincide with the proposed change identified in a resolution number 512. Resolution number 518, amend the language of Article 17, Section 17.2, Paragraph 1 of the bylaws to remove the geographical location of the national headquarters. Comrade Commander, this completes the first reading of the report of the Committee on Constitution and Bylaws and the recommended changes to the Constitution and Bylaws. Thank you, Rob. There will be no action taken at this time. We'll hear the final report of the Constitution and Bylaws Committee at the final business session on Tuesday. National Adjutant Burgess, do you have any announcements? Join us right here in the Tampa Bay Ballroom for fun night tomorrow at 8 p.m. We'll be treated to the musical sounds of Jefferson Starship. This year's concert is sponsored by good friends at TriWest who generously donated to bring us the fun that we all will experience tomorrow evening. Don't forget that today at 4 p.m. is the cutoff for you to make reservations to attend the line officer dinner Tuesday night. We'll all need tickets to enter, and there'll be assigned seating, so make sure that you all get your reservations for your seats for the line officer dinner Tuesday night by 4 p.m. today. Our regular business uh, will begin again Tuesday morning at 8.30 a.m. We'll start off with committee reports, including the final report of the Constitution and Bylaw Committee. 
We'll hear reports on the Charitable Service Trust, the National Service Foundation, plus an update on our memorial in Washington, D.C. On Tuesday afternoon, we'll hold our final business session and conclude with nominations and elections of officers. Also, uh, you who wish to donate to any DAV entity in the interest of time are encouraged to fill out the form in your convention bags prior to making your way to our donation booth located near Will Call on level two. We're giving away three $50 gift certificates that can be redeemed at the DAV store online or here during National Convention. You must be present to win. If I call your name and you're in the hall, please see membership director Doug Wells up here on the stage as soon as we adjourn. And the lucky winners are Donald Hodges, Rexana Torres, Ireland, and Mickey Ganich. As Barry mentioned in his report, we're selling bricks in the HB plant ballroom on the second floor of the JW. And this is a special way you can be a part of our new National Headquarters Honor Garden. You can get your name on a brick or use it as an opportunity to honor a veteran in your life, past or present, or a caregiver. Please visit the Victories for Veterans booth in the hall, and we have a brick there that you can take a look at. You can also get a closer look at the trench art of New Guinea and learn how you can recognize the service and sacrifices of an important veteran in this special way. Commander, that's all my announcements. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. I ask Reverend Edwards to please lead us in a closing prayer. Our God, we realize that your power is without measure. The treasury of your goodness is without limit. For you have blessed the disabled American veterans with many dedicated members to carry on the work, the work of assisting other veterans and their families. Therefore, we ask you, Father, that you stay close to all of us, giving us help, wisdom, and perseverance in this most noble cause. In God we trust. Amen. Amen. The convention stands in recess until 8.30 a.m. Tuesday.